The New Zealand haka is one of the great sights in world rugby. A nation standing together, celebrating their country's unique culture and heritage, whilst putting out a stirring challenge to their opposition. A right now so deeply entrenched into the game that international rugby is almost unimaginable without it. And the haka has a surprisingly long history in the international game. It was first used by the New Zealand Maoris during their extraordinary 74 match tour of Britain in 1888. But it would really be carved into the fabric of the game during New Zealand's first fully representative tour of Mother Britain in 1905. A tour which saw a motley crew of unknown New Zealanders shock the British public with their dominance, earning them both their status as a giant of the game and also their now legendary nickname, the All Blacks. But interestingly, in these early years, the haka was only performed when the All Blacks were on tour. A custom which would only change in 1921, when that other 20th century giant of the game, the South African Springboks, toured New Zealand for the first time. A tour which was expected to finally decide the status of world champions, albeit unofficial. And fittingly, that series would prove to be a fascinating contest, with New Zealand coming to a near standstill as they watched it all unfold. Indeed, their first ever test was played in a packed Carisbrook Stadium in Dunedin. Special trains had to be commissioned in order to meet the demand heading towards the ground. And in addition to packing that rickety old stadium to the rafters, some 10,000 people dug into a hill overlooking that stadium, a mound they used to call the Scottish or the Caledonian Grandstand because of the free vantage point it offered its patrons. And much to the Springboks' surprise, it was the All Blacks who clinched that opening test. But the educated boot of South Africa's prince of fullbacks, Gerard Morkel, squared the series at Eden Park, so setting up a crucial deciding test match in the capital city of Wellington. And it was here in Wellington, ahead of this all-important deciding third test, that the All Blacks now decided to perform their famous haka on home soil. And you may be surprised to hear that the Springboks immediately reciprocated with an inklamu, a Zulu war cry of their own. But as luck would have it, the conditions in Wellington that day were absolutely atrocious. Indeed, the Springbok hooker, Toki Schultz, took one look at the pitch before describing it as a lake, with patches of mud showing like raisins on a poor man's Christmas pudding. Indeed, it quickly became apparent that constructive rugby that afternoon would be near impossible, an observation evidenced by the very, very dour-looking final score, a nil-nil draw. So this first test series between the Springboks and the All Blacks was tied, and the crown of rugby's first world champions would have to remain on the mantelpiece. But that in Glamu, our very own Springbok version of the haka, has now largely been forgotten. Indeed, a search on Google confirms the levels of uncertainty surrounding this episode in Springbok rugby. Google results point to a string of articles written in 2007, when Jake White, then the Springbok coach, considered reviving the Inklamu ahead of the World Cup of that year. And these articles all seem to indicate that the Springbok war cry had last been performed in 1926. A strange year considering the Springboks didn't play in 1926. And then when people on web forums have asked about the lyrics of that old war cry, the response has been inconclusive, a chant seemingly lost to antiquity. But having done some research, I can tell you that the following is clear. That the story of the Springbok in Glamu tracks beautifully the first five tours between the All Blacks and the Springboks between 1921 and 1956. Because having splashed their way through their respective war cries in that final test in Wellington in 1921, the Springboks and the All Blacks met for a second series seven years later in South Africa in 1928. And this time being on tour, the All Blacks of course performed their famous haka, as was their established custom. And again, the Springboks reciprocated simultaneously with their own Zulu war cry, an Intlamu which, by now, we know was led by a Springbok debutant, a young man called Philip Nell. He had been born to a farm in the Kranskorp district bordering Zululand in 1902, and so as a child he grew up fluent in Zulu. Indeed, having been born just 23 years after the famous Battle of Isandlwana, Philip probably would have heard first-hand accounts of this famous battle from aging but very proud Zulu warriors, 
because Isan Luana saw the Zulu people register an incredible victory. A victory whereby Shaka's old pincer movement had outsmarted the mighty British army. Then, the most powerful and modern military force on planet Earth. And so Philip Nell's strong connection to these impressive Zulu people rendered him the obvious choice to lead the Springbok in Jamu of 1928. And what an amazing sight. To see these two rugby giants celebrating their respective cultures and heritage, while of course drawing inspiration from their brave warriors. And again, the second series in 1928 would live up to its name. Another tightly fought series which, amazingly, also ended in a tie, two test matches apiece, and so again leaving the status of unofficial world champions in the balance. This was developing into a very special rivalry. They would meet for a third time nine years later, when the Springboks again toured New Zealand in 1937. Philip Nell was by now a veteran, and indeed Springbok captain. And while Google indicates that the Springbok in Glamu had been put to bed in the 1920s, I have seen video footage of the Springboks performing their Zulu war cry during these test matches of 1937. By now the All Blacks were routinely performing their haka both home and away, while the South Africans, it seems, reserved their Zulu in Glamu primarily for their great foes, the All Blacks. And 1937 would prove to be another bruising set of encounters, which saw the Springboks arrive in Auckland for the final test with the series again all square at one test apiece. And this deciding test was to be played out at Fortress Eden Park, in front of 58,000 fanatical home fans, a test match which would prove to be, arguably, the Springboks' finest ever hour. For they proceeded to demolish the All Blacks by a remarkable five tries to nil. A time of great celebration for these Springboks, and a victory which has stood the test of time. But for me, it comes packaged with an uncomfortable sense of nostalgia. For this remains the only series we have ever won in New Zealand, and amazingly we haven't beaten the All Blacks in Auckland since that memorable day. And then regrettably, that remarkable final test would also be the last time that the Springboks delivered their traditional Zulu in Jamu. Because the interruption of World War II in 1939 meant that it would be another 12 years before the Springboks and the All Blacks battled it out for a fourth time, on this occasion in South Africa in 1949. And during this long interlude, South Africa had, of course, undergone a tragic transformation. Because a year before, in 1948, D.F. Milan and his National Party had, in a notable upset, won the South African general elections under their infamous election campaign, which they coined apartheid, meaning separateness. Because this system actively sought to tear our many cultures away from one another. A policy which accordingly forbade the All Blacks from bringing any Maori players to South Africa. So spawning a silent protest from the All Blacks, who then made the unprecedented decision to refrain from performing their famous haka on that tour of 1949. A decision which, ironically, probably pleased the South African authorities. For they too would of course be doing away with their Zulu in Jamu. Indeed, the very principle of apartheid was such that it could no longer stomach a rugby team of so-called Europeans, executing a war cry which celebrated the customs of an African people. And broadly speaking, this was one of apartheid's many great tragedies. Because now, devoid of opportunities to understand and celebrate one another's cultures, South Africa's rich cultural diversity was in time heavily diluted, and the national conversation degenerated instead into the hideously oversimplified concept of race. And so while my school history books were rich in detail on white history, the pioneers, the Great Trek, and the Anglo-Boer War, black South African history was covered fleetingly, really as more of a backdrop through which to understand European history, with critical moments in their story simply erased from the national conversation. Indeed, consider for example the quite remarkable incident of the SS Mendy, an accident which I would only learn about amazingly late in life. The SS Mendy was a ship carrying black South African soldiers in 1917 on their way to the front line in Flanders. However, the ship, which had been traveling without lights, as was required by a wartime procedure, was struck by another darkened vessel in the English Channel, and it had quickly become clear that it was destined to sink. At which point, these proud men assembled on the deck, and on realizing their fate, they stripped 
and they began to chant with all the pride they could muster the war cries Shaka had once taught their people. Until the crashing seas gradually rose above the deck, eventually silencing the men. An experience which survivors would declare had forever been etched into their memories. 646 men lost their lives in that incident. 607 of whom were black soldiers, more than double the combined Boer and British losses at the famously deadly Battle of Spionkop. And in truth, one of the most tragic single incidents in our country's history. An incident which at the time brought the all-white South African Parliament under Louis Boerta spontaneously to its feet, bowing their heads in silence to honour these brave men. And yet, astonishingly, this tragedy never made it into my history books, or even to my dinner table, gone and forgotten. This was how apartheid worked. Indeed, by 1956, when the Springboks took on the All Blacks for a fifth time, the Springbok in Glamour was already all but lost to the world, an old ritual slowly fading from our collective memory. And 1956 was also an important year in the race-based tragedy which was beginning to unfold rapidly in South Africa. Indeed, just five days after a Springbok victory in the second test in Wellington in 1956, the apartheid government was rocked by a huge protest march by women to the Union buildings, a march which we still commemorate annually on August the 9th as our National Women's Day holiday. And this march was part of a new mass resistance to apartheid which had been brewing and which was rendering the South African government increasingly nervous, indeed eventually prompting their decision to swoop on leaders of the resistance movement, so resulting in the mass arrest of an unprecedented 156 struggle leaders from all over the country, including the likes of both Nelson Mandela and Chief Albert Lutuli. And they were then all transported to the notorious Johannesburg prison, known then simply as the Fort. Ironically, today, the premises of our constitutional court. And here, in December 1956, exactly 60 years ago, these leaders were held for two weeks in atrocious conditions in a communal cell. But notwithstanding the conditions, this soon developed into a convention for freedom fighters, a platform where knowledge and ideas were shared, and a new unity was forged, a unity demonstrated when these men broke into a series of war cries, and in Tlamu, initially led by a young Zulu freedom fighter, Masabalala Yangwa, before the veteran, Zulu chief Albert Lutuli sprung into life, standing forward and bellowing, Ngushaka law, this is Shaka. And with that, all the men joined in in solidarity, a rousing moment recalled vividly by Nelson Mandela in his autobiography. And so, while the Ndlamu was by now dead to the Springboks, it lived on, of course, in the culture of these proud African people. A ritual which rises to the surface during times of great importance. So 2017 is, in several respects, going to be an auspicious year. Firstly, it is the centenary of the sinking of the SS Mendy, a sacrifice which we as a nation should collectively be remembering on February the 21st. And then it is, of course, 80 years since our only ever series victory in New Zealand. 80 years since our last test victory in the city of Auckland. And 80 years since the Springboks last executed their traditional Njlamu. And wouldn't it be a wonderful gesture to revive this old Springbok tradition when we run out into the field to take on the All Blacks in Auckland on September 16th, 2017. A statement to the world that we are now recognizing and celebrating the diverse cultures of the South African people. And while the internet can no longer remember the lyrics of that Ndlamu, I was recently given a disc by Pete Nell, the son of Philip Nell, following a talk I gave in Durban about those remarkable 1937 Springboks. And on this disc is an interview with Philip Nell himself. An interview in which he outlines the words and the meaning of our old Ndlamu. It is there for the taking. Bushaka Lord.